Stand up with me, if you will. I want to read uh, out of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing in his very first letter to the church in Corinth. You know, he started churches all over that part of the world. And in 10, 31, it says, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. Let's bow our heads, please, for prayer. Father, I'm so thankful for this good day where you have seen fit to allow us to be in this place at this appointed time. Father, I'm so grateful that we have the, the privilege of being able to worship you in, in freedom. So uh, we offer this time to you today, Lord. I pray that uh, it will be worth everyone's time to have gotten out of bed on perhaps their only day off and come to a house of worship. Uh, teach us what you would have us know. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of the living God wants to communicate to us this day. I ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Uh, we're, I'm going to be seated. I want to talk to you about uh, the importance of the church. Uh, the church, as you all know, if you are believers, the church is the body of Christ. We have the Spirit of the living God living within us, but we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And so we are to be about his work and serving him and loving him and ministering to others and so forth. A church a churchgoer wrote a letter uh, to the editor of a local newspaper and complained that it made no sense to go to church every Sunday. And he said, I've gone to church for 30 years. And in that time, I have heard over 3,000 sermons. But for the life of me, I can't remember a single one of them. He says, I think I'm wasting my time, and the pastors are wasting their times preparing messages. So this started a real controversy within that local community, and letters to the editor columns started just blowing up. And it went on for weeks and weeks until somebody wrote this. And this person said, I've been married for 30 years, and in that time, my wife has cooked over 32,000 meals. But for the life of me, I can't remember a single menu for a single one of the meals that she cooked. But I do know this. I know that they all nourished me and gave me strength that I needed to do my work every day. If my wife had not provided those meals for me, I would not be physically alive today. And if I hadn't gone to church for nourishment spiritually, I would be spiritually dead today in all likelihood. So we thank God for our physical and our spiritual nourishment. I want to tell you something. The church is a big deal to God. See, he is the one who founded it. He founded the, the church he founded the family, and then he founded the church. So it is an important thing for all of us. 20 years ago, back in the, over 20 years ago, back in the early 1990s, the church growth movement in the United States was going strong. A few pastors uh, who had been in large churches left the pastorate and became church growth experts. And they said that if a church does certain things in certain ways, that their churches would grow and become prominent in their towns and far beyond. And what that pastor wasn't interested, and what pastor was not interested in that kind of notoriety and that kind of growth. See, they talked about issues like having enough parking. Now, listen, all of these things are important, but we can do all of these things and still not get it right. Having enough parking where people don't have to walk so far. Having friendly, smiling, outgoing greeters at the door or in the parking lot. Providing enough seating in an auditorium so that people are comfortable. Uh, and you'll notice maybe that in many churches that people will sit and then they will leave a space and somebody else will sit beyond that. They've talked about the need for high quality nursery and preschool care because if you don't take care of the children of those who come and especially of those who visit then people in all likelihood 
won't come in to hear you preach. Worship services had to be entertaining and music had to be well done. Just like everything should be well done, quite frankly. They talked a lot about felt needs, about those things that we think that we have to have. And they said that if you do those things, then growth will be inevitable. In 2010, one of my favorite speakers, uh, Chuck Swindoll, wrote a highly acclaimed book entitled The Church Awakening. It was called An Urgent Call for Renewal. And in his book, Swindoll talked about the importance of health for churches in the 21st century. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about in the time that I have. We're supposed to, 1230? Is that what time you told? I'm just, I'm just kidding. Just relax. He explained the difference in church growth as opposed to church health. See, we think, when we think about Piedmont being a healthy church, our thoughts might go to maybe bigger budgets, more or bigger programs, increased attendance, enlarging the membership, greater influence locally and beyond, increased baptisms in every church ought to be interested in souls being saved, outranking other churches that are about our size, and all those kinds of things. Here's the lesson that I have learned. I've learned that if something is alive, then its very nature is to grow. If something or someone is healthy, then in all likelihood it is going to grow. If it's unhealthy, it won't. I am a until I went to work at FPD, I was a big gardener. And all that's kind of gone by the board, but that's neither here nor there. I've had an apple and a pear tree that were huge. They were beautiful, lots of foliage. But in the spring and summer, just when I thought I would be picking fruit, there wasn't any. Something somewhere that caught had caused fruit not to be produced on those particular trees. Here's the question. Was it a big, beautiful tree? Yes, it was. Was it a healthy tree? Apparently, it wasn't. It produced shade, and that was nice. But I planted it so I would get apples and pears. You see, when something is healthy, it will produce fruit. I've been a part of two churches for the most part in my lifetime. One was a large church. It had over 1,200 on Sundays and a, over a $2 million budget. The other was a small church out in the sticks where the sun didn't come up till about 1030. We had about 175 on Sundays and about a $400,000 budget. But I want to tell you, the small church was much healthier than the large church for a number of reasons. One, it had a clearly defined mission. The people in that church were all moving in the same direction. They loved each other, they loved God, and they had a servant mentality. The much larger church was one that finally got to a point where there was no vision, it was trying to survive, it did not treat people particularly well. Leadership was lacking, and people expected to be served. I want to tell you, the health of Piedmont is important because it needs to be your desire as a church family for your life and your church's life to be one of health. We know that churches come in all different shapes, sizes, denominations, and socioeconomic levels. We understand all of that. Each church has its own style, its own character, and its own personality, and its own makeup. Chuck Swindoll said, when someone is looking for the best church, they need to find one. I want you to hear this. They need to find one that meets their family's needs. No one would go to a church that didn't do that, that meets their family needs while giving them the opportunity to meet the needs of others. 
What kind of needs are we talking about? Every church needs strong, solid, committed, biblical preaching with practical application. Each church should have vibrant, dynamic worship. There should be adequate programming for children and preschoolers and youth. There should be a warm, welcoming fellowship. Years ago, when I was on staff at, at another church, Cynthia and I would take single adults skiing, snow skiing. We called it a retreat. Everybody laughed, but it was a snow skiing trip. And uh, on the way, we'd have a great time. Sometimes we could ski, and sometimes it would look like outside where there was no snow. But on the way back, every Sunday, we would stop about 11 o'clock somewhere, and we were dressed about like king. So you make your own judgments there. And so, you know, we had on jeans and boots and sweaters and so forth. We didn't have on coats and ties. Well done here, by the way. And so we would, go, we would stop at some church, and many times it would be the first Baptist church in some town, and, and they would always put us in the back corner or up in the balcony away from everybody. I don't know. Anyway, and so one, one time, we, it, it was 5 after 11, and we said, well, let's just stop at the first place we see. So we did. It's called Gold Hill Missionary Baptist Church. And it was a beautiful church out in the middle of nowhere, and we stopped. And we came in, and it was an African-American church. And I want to tell you something. They wrapped their loving arms around us, didn't they, Cynthia? We got to be friends with them. Next year, we stopped there on purpose. The next year, we called them and told them we were coming. The next year, the pastor called us and said, would y'all come back? We'll have lunch for you. The next year, the pastor said, would you preach for us? And I thought, what an honor. And I'm going to tell you, we developed a friendship with those brothers and sisters. They ultimately came to our church and worshiped with us and came to our house. We had, we had the common bond of Christ. And, and the, the, the reason we wanted to go back was because of the fellowship and the, the love that those folks shared with us. It was spectacular. And we still swapped Christmas cards. I want to tell you, it was the best. When someone is looking for the best church, one that meets their family's needs, and two, gives you the opportunity to meet the needs of others. Too many times in too many churches, folks quit looking after the first part, which says a church that meets our needs. Listen, if we're going to pattern our lives after Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, then let's remember that He is the one who said that I have come not to be served, but to what? Serve. Let's say that again. I've come not to be served, but to... That's what we are looking for in a church that is full of health. Listen, different churches are known for different things. Some are like hospitals for the sick and wounded or hurting. Others maybe remind us of the big revival churches. Others are, are churches that, that help folks uh, in the community. Some remind us of family-oriented life centers where they have all of the activities that anyone could ever need. Others are like theaters where the music and drama and arts are emphasized. All of those things are great. The focus, the direction... The activities are valuable and they're necessary, but they aren't the church's primary purpose, nor do they make the church a healthy church. They just may do those things that they do very well. A healthy church is one that reflects several significant qualities that we're going to talk about here. I prayed last night that God would give all of us, all of us, eyes to see ears to hear, and hearts to feel so that Piedmont would become healthy in the sight of the one who created us, who created it, not in the sight of church growth experts who think if you do this formula, then you will become healthy. By the way, listen, 
Being a healthy church isn't a one and done opportunity. Being a healthy church is a long time process. And we don't get healthy once and stay healthy from here on out, do we? That's why we make the same New Year's resolutions year after year after year. Some of y'all don't are not laughing at that, but you're the ones I'm probably talking to. Listen, being a health, hear this, being a healthy church is a never-ending process, but that's all right. Our walk with Jesus is a never-ending process, isn't it? There are highs and lows, ups and downs. Listen, there are seasons in the spiritual life. Sometimes we're in the the season of, of spring and summer when there's great growth and we're enjoying it and everything is going well with us spiritually and relationally with others. But then there are, there's the season where it's winter and things are dormant and it doesn't feel like much growth or much joy sometimes. But listen, we stay faithful. We stay with it. We continue to do the things that ultimately bring us health. Piedmont, you may be coming out of the winter into the hope of a joyous spring and a summer where there is health and growth. And that's where we want to be. I want to give you just a few things. If you want to write them down, great. If not, just ask your spouse what I said. A, a healthy church glorifies God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. To glorify God means that we magnify, that we focus on, that we elevate, that we draw attention to the presence and the realness of God. This is the primary purpose of the church and of individual Christians. I love what, having worked at FPD for a while, I love what the Westminster Shorter Catechism says about the chief end of man. What, what's our real purpose? And it says, the chief end of man, the real purpose of man, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's the primary purpose of the church. That ought to be the primary purpose of yours and my life, to to glorify God with the life that we live and to enjoy Him. This ought to be an enjoyable time that we spend together. Personally, we do this by inviting Him, by giving God access to every area of our lives, by sharing with others about His greatness instead of seeking glory for ourselves, and ultimately by working on our relationship with Him. See, the Bible teaches us how we're to glorify God. We do it by meeting with Him often as we pray, by admitting to others that we are also having struggles in our life, and by continually asking ourselves, will what I'm doing bring glory to God, or is it simply to bring glory to me? A church that feeds our desire to glorify God, my friends, is a healthy church. Paul said, whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. A healthy church glorifies God. Also, a healthy church worships God with a genuine spirit of devotion and affection. I think we've done that today, Pastor Chris. Christians in Jesus' day, Luke wrote this in Acts, Christians in that day were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Luke said they felt that they kept feeling a sense of awe as they worshiped. See, the early church took communion and prayer, and they worshiped together with a spirit of awe of who God is and what He means to them and all of those things that he has done. You and I have a tendency to forget those things that God has done in our lives. Sometimes our focus is on now 
instead of on our glorious past, on those things where he has shown us that he is faithful. Let me tell you, if he was faithful three years ago, he is still faithful today. As they worshiped, God the Father was exalted. Jesus the Son was lifted up. And the Holy Spirit of God brought new expressions of freedom. You see, they had been under the bondage of the Old Testament law. And now as followers of Christ, now us as followers of Christ, we experience the joy that this new freedom in Christ brings to us. I have to make myself sometimes, when I'm in worship, I have to make myself focus on what we are doing. I have to make myself focus on the goodness of God. That's why I love it that, that we have the words up here. That helps me remember all that he has done for me. I think I probably am pretty serious ADHD. And I need to be often reminded so I'll remember the goodness of God and how I'm here to worship him and not let things like, like a, a, a tablet or something or, or what's going to happen when we get out of here or lunch or what's happening tonight. I, have to make, I need to make myself focus on the immediate so that he and I might commune together. Our focus needs to be on him as our creator and as our savior, as the one who brings us great joy. See, there are times when songs are sung and scripture is read, announcements are made, sermons are given, but worship is missing. We have to make ourselves, we need to encourage ourselves to focus on those things. To determine the health of a church's worship, ask yourself, does my soul encounter the presence of the Lord? Do I become lost in wonder and praise that is worthy of, uh, to Him? A church that experiences meaningful worship is the sign of a healthy church. Third, a healthy church balances biblical instruction, like, like I hope this is today, with personal application. The early church emphasized biblical teaching, and that was so important then because they didn't have the word to look, look into like you and I do these days. Solid, consistent teaching from God's word helps us grow in several ways. It matures and stabilizes our faith. When we get tested, we have something we fall back on, and that is the word of God. It increases our ability to detect and confront error. That was a problem that they had in the early church because they didn't have any, what was written down there, the words that Jesus had said. And so they're, they're hearing those who have met Jesus, Paul who has known him, Paul who, who followed him, uh, the disciples who preached, that, that's what they had to go on and sometimes there would be error in what they were saying. Constant reading of the word gives us wisdom. How many sermons have we heard that we asked when it was over, so what does that mean to me? I hope you don't walk out of here today asking that question. How will we know the truth unless we have read and studied the truth? Otherwise, we simply we, we kind of default back to, to what we have heard, maybe by a professor or some teacher somewhere, or one of our friends who maybe is not a believer or whatever it happens to be. A major struggle that we have today in our schools is this. There is a lack of biblical training. I understand, I understand public schools and non-sectarian schools. I understand that. It is important in our homes, in our families, in our churches that there is never a lack of biblical teaching and training. Because when there is, you and I end up with a very weak foundation. Ask this, what do I base my faith and my life on? If it isn't scripture, then we just repeat what a secular or even a religious professor perhaps may have told us, and then we buy into that. The opposite of practical biblical teaching is teaching that remains theoretical. That's the opposite of practical biblical teaching. Is that which remains just theoretical. It's just something else that we 
file away. You see, it's important that you and I know the truth and that we live the truth and that we teach the truth to those who are in our circle of influence. But it never needs to become, look what I know, how much I know. That is theoretical. That is not life-giving. That is not sustaining us as followers of Christ. Preaching and teaching, that doesn't balance instruction with love and with grace may produce some biblical intolerance, the kind that if you don't believe exactly like me, then we're not brothers or sisters in Christ. Listen, there is way more that connects us than those, those things that divide us. When biblical knowledge becomes an end within itself, it is dangerously close to idolatry. Listen, we don't worship the Bible. We love the Bible. We read the Bible. It, it shows us the truth of God. Listen, we worship the one who is responsible for it. And his name is Jesus. Biblical knowledge needs to be practical and it needs to have application. Worship and biblical instruction coupled, coupled with compassionate application or signs of a healthy church. Next, a healthy church conveys warmth and fellowship. Not only was the early church glorifying God and worshiping and individuals having devotion to the Lord and instruction and application, but Luke said they were continually devoting themselves to fellowship. That means they cared for each other. That means they spent time with each other, fellowshipping with each other. Classroom teacher had students from different backgrounds, and they, they were talking about some of the differences in their religious backgrounds. And a young boy named Abraham was a Jewish boy. So they, the teacher, I got ahead, the teacher said, I want you to go home, and I want you to bring back something that uh, is exemplar, exemplified in your religion, what you believe. So Abraham, a Jewish boy, comes back, and he has a menorah with the seven candles, and he said, this is a menorah, this is part of our tradition. He says, that's outstanding. Anthony, a young Catholic boy, brought a crucifix, and he said, this is emblematic of the Catholic faith. And John was a Baptist boy, and he brought a casserole, <laughs> which was emblematic of the Baptist faith. Listen, well, which bleeds right into we fellowship with each other. When we share something tangible with somebody who is in need, when we are with someone when they are experiencing sorrow and joy, I love it when I see schools and churches and neighbors and you name it, even in businesses. I love to see it that when there is a struggle, maybe there's a death or an illness, a divorce or a child who's gone the wrong direction, when people rally around those folks, and they serve them, and they love them, and they minister to them when things are not going well. There's a line that I usually use in weddings that I do uh, as, as we're bringing two individuals together for life. It says, when a couple shares a grief, it is halved. When they share a joy, it is doubled. See, that needs to be indicative of the way that you and I, as followers of Christ, live our lives. The healthy church is a community of believers who demonstrate genuine concern for each other. Fifth, a healthy church reaches out to others. Yes, we are interested in the souls of men and women, boys and girls, and we reach out with the gospel, with the good news to all of those. I love that, that Piedmont continues to have a ministry uh, in Guatemala. I love that you all have gone out in the neighborhoods in the past and done things that minister to people who, uh, who are in your area. The church uses worship, instruction, and fellowship to equip Christians to take the message of God's love to the world. A healthy church reaches out beyond these four walls. A healthy church has a contagious style. Not like, don't get near me, I'm contagious. It has a contagious style. Bill Hybels wrote a book years ago called Becoming 
a contagious Christian. And let me tell you what that is. A contagious Christian is someone that others want what they have. Where it would normally be, don't touch me, I'm contagious. As followers of Christ is, I'm contagious. You need what I have. Or I want what you have if you're a contagious Christian. You see, we don't want to be people who repel others, who keep somebody else from wanting to know what you have. We want to be a contagious Christian where when people spend some time around you, they begin to think, that's, that's, a, pretty good, that's a pretty good thing. I'll, I'll, I want what he has or what she has or what they have. Four features comprise a contagious lifestyle. And with this, I'm through. It is biblical in content. Messages that are based on the Bible and not on the opinions or the interest of someone else. The nature of a healthy church is to be authentic. See, I think that's what lost people, people who are without Christ, I think that's what they are looking for. I think they are looking for somebody who is authentic, who walks what they say. It's a church that believes what it says. It's not phony. It's not hypocritical. The nature of a healthy church is to be authentic. And listen, that means here, and that means in your daily life, where you live, your circle of influence. Be authentic. Next, its attitude is one of graciousness. The church sees itself as friends and as family and as servants. Not, not as a, a corporation. Listen, I understand that there's a business part of the church. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm saying that the church sees ourselves for the most part as family, as friends. And healthy churches are relevant in their approach to ministry. They teach how the Bible applies to today's issues and today's concerns and our needs. I'm going to recap this. Somebody said that when, before I gave my first sermon many, many years ago. This is, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So I'm fixing to tell you what I've told you. I want to see our churches glorify God the Father, the Son, and His Spirit. I want to see churches that foster a spirit of devotion to the one who gave us life, that teaches a I want to see a church that teaches us scripture with relevant application, what it means to our life. May, may, I, I want to see our church generate warmth toward others. And, and, and may we touch those who are outside our congregations with the wonderful news of Christ and as servants to them. And I want us to do all of this in a winsome, warm, contagious manner. And I want to tell you, when that happens... We are well on our way to becoming a healthy church. The best church is one that meets needs while giving people the opportunity to meet the needs of others. It meets our needs, and it gives us the opportunity to meet the needs of others. I see signs of health here, but it doesn't stop here this day. It's an ongoing, daily, moment-by-moment -moment process of becoming healthy and staying healthy.